Well, the breaking news of the day from President Biden came just a few floor below, a few floors below where I'm sitting right now at an ice cream shop where the president shopped after uh, stopping by the to taping the Seth Meyers show. And that took place a few floors above where I'm sitting right now in the ice cream shop, which the president could not pass up before getting in his motorcade and unlocking the gridlock traffic in midtown Manhattan by leaving. The president said he is negotiating a ceasefire in Gaza that he hopes will be in force next Monday. We're close. We're close. It's not done yet. And my hope is by next Monday, we'll have a ceasefire. The president also confirmed in the ice cream shop that he's going to travel to the southern border in Texas on Thursday. He said he planned that trip before the White House knew that Donald Trump also plans to go to the southern border on Thursday, 350 miles away from where President Biden will be in Brownsville, Texas. Oh, and Joe ordered mint chip and Seth ordered honeycomb. Hi, how are you? Hi. We've got mint chip, we've got coffee avocado. How about mint chip? Mint chip, you got it. And how about the sugar? Sugar cone? Yeah. Okay. I was worried you were going to be that guy who asked for all the samples. <laughs> <laughs> We can get you some samples. By the way, I'm the last of the big spenders in the East, so I can put whatever he's at. Oh, but look at that. I'll oh. do that a honeycomb. Honeycomb? Yeah. Would you like that on a waffle cone? I'll have it the same way. Sugar yeah. cone? You got it. You got it. While Joe Biden was happily mixing with the people of New York and making news around the world from an ice cream shop on 6th Avenue, five blocks away from where Donald Trump used to live, the people of the state of New York were crushing Donald Trump in court. The people of the state of New York against Donald J. Trump defendant is the official name of the criminal case that District Attorney Alvin Bragg is prosecuting against Donald Trump, which will be the very first criminal trial that Donald Trump has to go through beginning on March 25th. It is the trial in which Trump supporters might get to listen to the under oath testimony of porn star Stormy Daniels explaining how and why Donald Trump paid her $130,000 during his first presidential campaign to keep his adventures with Stormy Daniels secret in a deliberate deception intended to deceive American voters about Donald Trump before they voted in 2016. Having watched enough of defendant Trump's antics in various courtrooms, including mostly New York City courtrooms, District Attorney Alvin Bragg has seen enough. He filed a 331-page motion for a gag order on defendant Trump in that case. The motion says, to protect the integrity of this criminal proceeding and avoid prejudice to the jury, the people respectfully request that this court issue a narrowly tailored order restricting certain prejudicial extrajudicial statements by defendant. Defendant has a long history of making public and inflammatory remarks about the participants in various judicial proceedings against him, including jurors, witnesses, lawyers, and court staff. Those remarks, as well as the inevitable reactions they incite from defendant's followers and allies, pose a significant and imminent threat to the orderly administration of this criminal proceeding. The motion offers voluminous evidence of the danger Donald Trump poses to everyone involved in the case, including witnesses and jurors. The motion seeks to restrict Trump comments about the prosecutors, but it specifically does not include District Attorney Alvin Bragg himself as someone Donald Trump would not be allowed to talk about. District Attorney Bragg has deliberately not asked the court to protect him from Donald Trump's threats. 
A five-page affidavit appears toward the end of the motion. It's easy to miss that affidavit for most of the news media discover, describing the contents of this motion. It begins with the name of the person filing this affidavit, and the next sentence says, I am a sergeant in the New York Police Department. Since January of 2022, I have served as the commanding officer of the security detail of New York County District Attorney Alvin Bragg. I monitor threats in coordination with the NYPD's Threat Assessment and Protection Unit, a unit within the NYPD's Intelligence Bureau. In 2022, Threat Assessment and Protection Unit logged 483 threat cases. Of the 483 threat cases, one involved threats to the district attorney, his family, or his employees. So the year before Alvin Bragg prosecuted Donald Trump, he got only one of the 483 credible threats issued to New York City officials. The affidavit continues. In 2023, Threat Assessment and Protection Unit logged 577 threat cases. Of the 577 threat cases, 89 involved threats to the district attorney, his family, or his employees. In 2023, the first threat case involving the district attorney, his family, or his employees was logged on March 18th, 2023. Here is what happened on March 18th, 2023. Donald Trump announced on social media that he, quote, will be arrested on Tuesday by District Attorney Alvin Bragg. The affidavit continues. By March 20th, 2023, the volume of threatening, harassing, or offensive calls and emails increased significantly, exceeding the capacity of the DA office investigators and NYPD detectives detailed to the DA's office. Starting on March 20th, 2023, all such calls and emails were forwarded directly to Threat Assessment and Protection Unit for review and assessment. Since the DA took office on January 1st, 2022 through mid-March of 2023, none of the threats received required referral for further investigation in partnership with a prosecutor's office. In the three weeks following March 18th, 2023, several threats were received that ultimately were referred for further investigation in partnership with a prosecutor's office. One public example of a threat during that time period is documented in the felony complaint in People v. Craig DeLue Robertson. The complaint details that on or about March 18th, 2023, the defendant did knowingly transmit in interstate commerce, a communication containing a threat to injure the person of another, the New York County District Attorney Alvin Bragg, to it. Alvin Bragg, heading to New York to fulfill my dream of eradicating another of George Soros' two-butt political hack DAs. I'll be waiting in the courthouse parking garage with my suppressed Smith & Wesson M&P 9mm to smoke a radical fool prosecutor that should never have been elected. I want to stand over Bragg and put a nice hole in his forehead with my 9mm and watch him twitch as a drop of blood oozes from the hole as his life ebbs away to hell. Bye-bye to another corrupt bastard. That is what one Trump supporter wrote to Alvin Bragg the day that Donald Trump announced that he would soon be indicted by Alvin Bragg. The affidavit refers to more than 600 emails and phone calls received at the DA's office that were threatening. A small sample is included in the affidavit. March 19th, 2023, leave Trump alone or Bragg will get assassinated. March 19th, 2023, just shoot Bragg in the head and he stops being a problem. March 21st, 2023, if you lay a hand on President Trump or his family, friends, supporters, or myself, my family, or any patriot, instant death. March 22nd, 2023, just watched, just wanted to say, I can't wait to watch you swing from a rope in your military tribunal, your disgusting George Soros puppet, effing money will get you nowhere. You better get on your knees and pray to Jesus Christ. You're going to find your maker soon. We have every reason to believe that that is exactly what Donald Trump was hoping for when he announced he would soon be indicted by Alvin Bragg. Donald Trump has also attacked the judge in this case who has to decide whether to impose a gag order on Donald Trump. Donald Trump has also attacked the judge's family. 
Donald Trump's lawyers tried to pursue their appeal in New York today of the $83 million jury verdict against, uh, against Donald Trump in the E. Jean Carroll lawsuit that accused Donald Trump of rape. But Donald Trump's lawyers tried to do it on the cheap, which Judge Lewis Kaplan did not allow. Judge Kaplan filed a short order saying Mr. Trump has moved for an administrative stay of enforcement pending the filing and disposition of any post-trial motions that he may file. He seeks that relief without posting any security. The court declines to grant any stay, much less an unsecured stay, without first having afforded plaintiff a meaningful opportunity to be heard. Plaintiff shall make any response to the defendant's motion no later than 5 p.m. on February 29th. Any reply shall be filed no later than 5 p.m. on March 2nd. Special Prosecutor Jack Smith has responded to the Trump criminal defense lawyers claiming that Donald Trump is the victim of selective prosecution in the Florida case, where he is accused of violations of the Espionage Act and illegal possession of documents. Donald Trump's lawyers say that other former officials, including Joe Biden, after he left the vice presidency, have possessed some classified material and were not prosecuted. One of the necessary elements of a claim of selective prosecution is identifying a case where there was no prosecution, but it is so close in every way to the case being prosecuted that it shows that the prosecutors unfairly decide who is allowed to commit this crime and who gets prosecuted. Jack Smith's response says, the defendants have not identified anyone who has engaged in a remotely similar suite of willful and deceitful criminal conduct and not been prosecuted, nor could they. Indeed, the comparators on which they rely are readily distinguishable. For example, their primary comparator is Joseph R. Biden, whose conduct is described in the recently issued report by Special Counsel Robert K. Hur. But as the Hur report itself recognizes, several material distinctions between Mr. Trump's case and Mr. Biden's are clear. Most notably, Trump unlike Biden, is alleged to have engaged in extensive and repeated efforts to obstruct justice and thwart the return of documents bearing classification markings. And the evidence concerning the two men's intent, whether they knowingly possessed and willfully retained such documents, is also starkly different. There have been many government officials who have possessed classified documents after the ends of their terms in office often inadvertently, sometimes negligence, negligently, and very occasionally willfully. There have also been a very small number of cases in which former government officials who have been found in possession of classified documents have briefly resisted the government's lawful efforts to recover them. But there has never been a case in American history in which a former official has engaged in conduct remotely similar to Trump's. Leading off our discussion tonight is Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney and professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. She is co-host of the podcast Sisters in Law. Andrew Weissman is with us, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York. He is the co-host of the MSNBC podcast Prosecuting Donald Trump and co-author of the new book, The Trump Indictments, the Historic Charging Documents with com uh, Commentary, which will be released February 27th. They're both MSNBC legal analysts. And Joyce... Um, you, you rarely or never get to read a legal filing that says, never in history <laughs> have, have we as prosecutors or anyone in our court system ever seen anything like this documents case against Donald Trump. You know, it's so true, Lawrence. And one of the things that Trump likes to rely on across his cases is this argument that he's being targeted and singled out. No other president has ever been prosecuted in the history of our country. And that's because Donald Trump has engaged in singular criminal conduct that has to be prosecuted. I mean, folks have, have done everything that they could, hoping he would walk away and leave the political theater. But Trump continued to double down and commit crimes. Uh, Andrew Weissman, I, I want to go back to the situation in, in Manhattan, but feel free to comment on the documents case or, or anything else that we just mentioned here. But uh, there, there was... As we watched Alvin Bragg approach this trial date, 
uh, there were reasons to wonder, is the district attorney's office learning from what we're seeing in the various courtrooms around America that Donald Trump has infected, especially in New York City, where in one courtroom, things were kind of out of control. In another courtroom, they were very much in control. This filing uh, today seems to indicate that the district attorney's office has fully figured out uh, what Donald Trump wants to do in the courtroom, in and around the courtroom, and it looks like they're planning to try to stop it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they have learned. And one of the things that they could look to is not just Judge Ngoran, who issued a limited gag order with respect to attacking the judge's law clerk. Um, but they've learned from Judge Chutkin and the D.C. Circuit case and the recently concluded Judge Kaplan case involving E. Jean Carroll. And just to focus on the D.C. case, the D.C. case um, has a circuit court that is a, you know, a very lengthy decision about that gag order, largely affirming it. And the relief that the district attorney's office is seeking closely tracks that, including a footnote in the D.C. Circuit decision dealing with what the court's power is to deal with protection of witnesses and jurors at a trial. So they clearly looked at that and are taking steps. But I have to say that's sort of the small bore view of what's going on here. They've learned they don't want to put up with any nonsense. They have a judge, Judge Mershon, who by all accounts is very similar to Judge Kaplan. But in reading the submission, which is hundreds of pages, it is a report card on America. You, if you want to know what we have devolved into and what Trump has unleashed, um, with nobody um, who is in sort of the, in a position of responsibility in the Republican Party saying this has to stop, um, you know, threatening violence is not an appropriate response. Uh, just looking at this submission, it is so disheartening as to what has happened to America, because this shouldn't be an issue of politics. This is just like, you know, Russian interference is not an issue of politics. Engaging in violence to threaten jurors and to affect witnesses is something that is so beyond the pale, and it is completely documented by the district attorney's office. And, and Joyce, one of the reasons I wanted to read the affidavit about Alvin Bragg in particular is he's the exception. Alvin Bragg is carving himself out as a sacrificial exception to Donald Trump. You can continue to send the death threats his way. Donald Trump can continue to inspire death threats against Alvin Bragg and call him anything he wants to call him. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's that Alvin Bragg is trying to protect everyone else in the courtroom. It's a really remarkable commitment from Alvin Bragg, and it shows the kind of public servant that he is. I mean, you read those specific threats, people who talk about standing over him with their nine millimeter weapons. Um, but Alvin Bragg did something smart here. He tracked, as Andrew said, this uh, protective order in the District of Columbia. And he did that because when you're a judge, you really like to have a similar ruling that you mm -hmm. can hang your hat on. You know you're not going to get reversed, especially when the Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia has already affirmed this sort of an order. You're in very safe territory when you enter it. And Donald Trump has done nothing but give Judge Mershon reasons to accept this order from the DA. Trace Vance and Andrew Weissman, thank you both very much for starting off our discussions tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up, Republicans were in favor of banning in vitro fertilization. And now that Alabama Republicans have done it, Republicans in the House and Senate are lying about their records on that same issue. That's next with Senator Tina Smith. We've seen a lot of desperate backpedaling over the past few days from Republicans trying to sound reasonable and supportive on procedures like IVF because it's dawning on them that their agenda is horribly unpopular with most Americans. Republicans own what happened in Alabama. Republicans own the disasters of Roe v. Wade. And Republicans will learn when it comes to attacks on their personal freedom, 
American people do not easily forget. Last week, Alabama's Republican state Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos are legally children in the state of Alabama. The ruling has completely shut down in vitro fertilization in the state of Alabama, including for parents who were in the middle of the process. After a few days of public outrage, some Republicans have realized the enormity of the problem they have created. Donald Trump was the first Republican to publicly disagree with the Alabama ruling, followed then by Alabama's Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville, who had to reverse himself after fully supporting the decision that frozen embryos are children. And most Republican members of the House of Representatives voted for a bill saying exactly that, that embryos are children, including Representative Nancy Mace, who is now saying, I will stop any and all efforts to ban IVF. Nancy Mace was one of the 167 Republicans who co-sponsored the Life at Conception Act in 2021, which defines a human being as, quote, each and every member of the species Homo sapiens at all stages of life, including the moment of fertilization, cloning, or other moment at which an individual member of the human species comes into being. Embryos are fertilized eggs, which means that Nancy Mace and most of her Republican colleagues in the House of Representatives were in favor of exactly what many of them now say they oppose as soon as it got a day's worth of public attention. The same thing in the United States Senate. Democrat Tammy Duckworth of Illinois, who lost both of her legs serving in Iraq, conceived her two daughters with the help of IVF. Senator Duckworth introduced a bill to protect the right to in vitro fertilization in all 50 states, and Republicans blocked the bill from ever coming to a vote. Not a single Republican senator supported that bill. It's been crickets since the, the uh, Alabama ruling. And let's make it clear, Republicans will say whatever they need to say to try to cover themselves on this, but they've been clear, and Donald Trump has been the guy leading this effort to eliminate women's reproductive rights and reproductive choice. And so this is the next step. And by the way, not a single Republican has reached out to me on the bill. Republicans are also opposed to contraception and what some of them call recreational sex, which invites the question, if it's not recreational, what is it? Professional? Such are the twisted perversions of the Republican mind in the House of Representatives, where 195 House Republicans voted against the Right to Contraception Act. That's right. The overwhelming majority of the Republicans in the House of Representatives are opposed to contraception. According to a new national poll, when voters were informed that House Republicans are opposed to contraception, 64% said they would be less likely to support a Republican candidate for Congress. It seems that the path to winning majorities in the House and the Senate for the Democrats now involves nothing other than telling voters the whole truth about the Republican candidates. Joining us now is Democratic Senator Tina Smith of Minnesota. She previously served as Executive Vice President of Planned Parenthood in Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. Senator, thank you very much for being here. Uh, it, it's so fascinating that this situation in Alabama has illuminated what Republicans have actually been up to in the Senate and the House uh, for a while now. Well, I mean, that's exactly right. And we know, I mean, actions speak louder than words. This is what my mother taught me, and it is just as true today as it was when she first told it to me. You can see by their actions that they are hell-bent to ban abortion, and they can't walk away from what their past actions have been when it comes to banning in vitro, uh, in, in vitro fertilization. And as you just went through, there's so many examples of how they have said, basically, our judgments, our, our judges, our politicians should be the ones deciding what happens to women's bodies and their lives. And I mean, it's laughable 
that they think that uh, that they need a message memo to explain to them that Americans want to be able to make these decisions for themselves. But, you know, they don't have a message problem. They have a policy problem that no message memo is going to fix. So uh, on in vitro fertilization, uh, the, the Republicans uh, are, are, you know, are just now running away from everything they've said, every position they've taken on in the past, because it's only now getting attention. Uh, is, is that basically the manual for campaigning uh, against Republicans this year, is simply show the voter what these people, the positions they've actually held? Now, I think that these Republican candidates are dramatically out of step with what most Americans believe. Most Americans believe that people should have the freedom to be able to make their own decisions about their own bodies and their own lives. And yet time after time, you've seen um, these extremist Republicans in the House and in the Senate uh, take steps to, uh, to, to be on the other side of that. And let's be really clear, too. There is a direct line from Donald Trump all the way through to that um, in vitro decision in Alabama. What he did to stack the U.S. Supreme Court so that they overturned Roe makes it possible for the Alabama Supreme Court to hold that decision that they have uh, just done and the impact that that has on women in Alabama. So there's no running away from the reality that their actions have put us in the position that we're in today. And that's why in this election, uh, it's going to be so important to help people turn out to make sure that they get the own, they have their own responsibility, their own control over their own bodies. Senator Tina Smith, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, thank Lawrence. You. And coming up, Sweden's 200 years of neutrality was tested almost to the breaking point many times. And now, in the face of Russian dictator Vladimir Putin's threats, Sweden is joining a military alliance for the first time. That's next with Yale history professor Timothy Snyder. Two hundred years of neutrality is coming to an end. Sweden has maintained two hundred years of military neutrality, but decided to join NATO in the face of Russian aggression led by the Russian dictator Vladimir Putin. Today, Hungary finally voted to approve Sweden's membership in NATO which would make Sweden the 32nd country to join the military alliance in which each country pledges to defend any other country in the alliance which suffers an attack. Sweden's prime minister said, we are joining NATO in order to defend what we are and everything we believe in even better. We are defending our freedom, our democracy, and our values together with others. Saturday, during a meeting of the United Nations Security Council, Poland's foreign minister responded to Russia's ambassador this way. Ambassador Nebendia has called um, Kiev the clients of the West. Actually, Kiev is fighting to be independent of anybody. He calls them a criminal Kiev regime. In fact, uh, Ukraine has a democratically elected uh, government. Um, he calls them Nazis. Well, the president is Jewish, the defense minister is Muslim, and they have no political prisoners. He said that Ukraine was wallowing in corruption. Well, uh, Alexei Navalny dem uh, documented uh, uh, how um, honest and full of probity uh, his own country is. He said that we are prisoners of Russophobia. Phobia means irrational fear, yet we are being um, threatened uh, almost every day by the former president of Russia and by um, Putin propagandists with nuclear annihilation. I put to you that it's not irrational. When Russia threatened, threatens us, we trust it. He is saying that we, the West, are somehow trying to persuade that Russia can never be beaten. Well, Russia didn't win the Crimean War. It didn't win the Russo-Japanese War. It didn't win World War I. It didn't win the Battle of Warsaw. It didn't win in Afghanistan. And it didn't win the Cold War. They failed to subjugate us then. They'll fail to subjugate Ukraine and us now. Joining our discussion now is Timothy Snyder, professor of history at Yale University. He is the author of The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America. Uh, Professor Snyder, you know, when I was listening to that, 
uh, very tight recitation of Russian history and Russian failures. Uh, I was, of course, thinking of you and thinking and wondering, how does the Russian mind process those facts? It, it, in Putin's Russia, those are the facts that are avoided. The, the, the vision of the past that Putin has tried to supply is one in which Russia is simultaneously never defeated and nevertheless always a victim. And this is why it's so helpful to have a good Polish government, a sound government in one of Russia's neighbors, why it's so good to know something about history, because it reminds us that the moments when Russia has actually made good policy choices have been the moments after defeat, after defeat in Crimea, after defeat against Japan. Um, these are the moments when it seemed like something in Russia could change. So we should remember that Russia has been defeated, but also take courage in the thought that Russia ought to be defeated also for the good of Russians. Uh, when, you, when you hear the, the Polish foreign ministers saying these things, uh, there, there's such a clarity to it that I'm sure everyone there agrees with, and including possibly secretly even members of the Russian delegation, understand that what he's saying is actually true. Of course, that's the case. I mean, one of the things which is so refreshing about Foreign Minister Sikorsky's presentation is that he accepts with us that there is truth, that it's it's worth responding to propaganda, not with more propaganda, but with calm recitations of what is going on and what has gone on. And of course, the, when you accept that truth matters, you're also accepting that you're making the truth, that you're taking responsibility for what's happening, that whether Russia wins or doesn't win has something to do with the things that you do. Because when you apprehend the truth, as opposed to listening to propaganda, you begin to think about what you can do and what you should do. And of course, Poland, the Europeans, and the Americans are in a position to do a lot to make sure that this war turns out the right way. How should we be thinking about this war at what is now the two-year mark? We are now the weak link. The Ukrainians have shown that they can do an awful lot with the little that we have given them. Right now, we're giving them nothing. We should be thinking of this as a long war, as a hard war, as a war where the Ukrainians are doing the suffering for us, as a war in which the Ukrainians are maintaining peace elsewhere for us, as a war in which we should be thanking them, and as a war in which we should be doing the things that we can do. All we have to do is supply them with what they need, and then we and they and everyone else will reap the benefits. And going forward, uh, Chuck Schumer certainly and President Biden are continuing to push uh, every angle they can on aid to Ukraine. Uh, what, what, how does Ukraine see what's happening in the United States? How does the President Zelensky and Ukraine's government see the, the current mess of American democracy on this within the Congress? Well, I mean, they, 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 of course, have to be diplomatic about things, and they, of course, try to find friends wherever they can. And in fairness, they do have a lot of friends in the Republican Party, as well as on the Democratic side, although, of course, almost all the Democrats are their friends. What, what they think, although, of course, the, the top of the government isn't going to say this, what they think is that a great deal of American political life has been captured directly or indirectly by Russia, that unfortunately, a lot of what's going on in our country isn't about the border or about domestic politics or about polarization or partisanship, that it has too much to do with too many people who are repeating what Russia says, repeating the kinds of things that Foreign Minister Sikorsky so eloquently rebutted, and acting, unfortunately, from the point of view of, of, of Russian interests, and in the interest of weakening democracy in general. That's what I should have said earlier, that the struggle for democracy in Ukraine, the struggle for democracy in the US are really one struggle. Yale Professor Timothy Snyder, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. And coming up, Joe Biden won the Democratic South Carolina presidential primary with 96 percent of the vote. Donald Trump won the Republican South Carolina presidential primary with 60 percent of the vote. And still, some of the news media can't tell which of the candidates is stronger within his own party. That's next with Simon Rosenberg when he joins us.
Do you think it's responsible for Democrats to put him at the top of the ticket, given those concerns? Responsible. I revere his record. I, I mean, this, what he's done in three years has been a master class, close to 15 million jobs. That's eight times more than the last three Republican presidents combined. The economy is booming. Inflation is cooling. It's 0.6 percent more than it was in the summer of 2020 at just 3.1 percent. Wait a second. We have American manufacturing coming back home all because of Biden's wisdom, because of his temperance, his yeah. capacity to lead in a bipartisan manner, which is an underrepresented point. Mm -hmm. And so I have great confidence moving forward. So the answer is absolutely all in in terms of the next four years, mm -hmm. Joe Biden. It's also worth noting that California Governor Gavin Newsom has exactly zero money to spend on a presidential campaign. That is true of every other Democrat not named Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. Presidential candidates, you must begin raising money for the campaign at least three years before the election. And then there is the obvious fact that no other Democrat actually wants to run for president. Some commentators are forgetting that a prerequisite for running for president is wanting to run for president. It's two years too late for any other Democrat to begin planning a presidential campaign. Every other Democrat is not polling as well as against Joe, uh, Donald Trump as Joe Biden polls against Donald Trump. So every other Democrat has a right to believe that he or she would lose to Donald Trump because they're polling worse than Joe Biden. And every other Democrat can easily calculate that the best time for them to run for president is four years from now when there will not be an incumbent president running for re-election. Meanwhile, Joe Biden won the Democratic South Carolina presidential primary three weeks ago with 96 percent of the vote. On Saturday night in the Republican South Carolina presidential primary, Donald Trump got 36 percent less than what Joe Biden got within his party in South Carolina. Donald Trump got 60% of the vote to Nikki Haley's 40% of the vote. As I said in our Saturday night coverage of the Republican South Carolina primary, that was a disastrous result for Donald Trump. But who cares what I think about it when we can ask Simon Rosenberg. Joining us now is Simon Rosenberg, longtime Democratic mm -hmm. strategist and author of Hopium Chronicles on Substack. Uh, Simon, I've been waiting to get your yeah. analysis of what we saw on Saturday night in South Carolina. Yeah, listen, there's been a basic pattern in our politics since the spring of 2022, and the Dobbs decision was leaked and then it was enacted, which is Democrats have continued to overperform expectations all across the country and Republicans have struggled. We saw it throughout 2022. We saw it throughout 2023. And we're now seeing it in the early part of 2024. Donald Trump has dramatically underperformed public polling now in all three of the early Republican uh, primary states. In Iowa, there was anemic turnout, another sign of weakness. And alarm bells should be going off, right? Trump is burning through more cash than he's raising. He's losing in all his court cases. The RNC is broke and replacing their leadership. House Republicans are abandoning ship and, and retiring at record numbers. Their thing is broke and broken right now. And I think that this idea that somehow you can look at all that and see something that's strong rather than weak is kind of, you know, a little bit hard for me to imagine. I think Donald Trump is in a much weaker figure in 2024 than he was in 2020. And as Gavin Newsom said, Joe Biden is gonna have a very strong record to run on this November. So we didn't have an exit poll asking uh, <clears throat> Haley voters, uh, would you not vote for Donald Trump in November? Uh, but, right. fo but Fox is reporting they have some analysis to indicate that it's a majority, a majority of Haley voters uh, saying that they will not vote for Donald Trump in November. You only need a small slice yeah. of Haley voters to not vote for Donald Trump, and it becomes impossible for Donald Trump to win. Well, it's not only that they're saying they won't vote for Donald Trump, they're saying they'll vote for Joe Biden, right? And Lawrence, we haven't seen polling like this in it probably since the early 1980s or the 1984 election, where so many people in one party have now said repeatedly in the early states where they see ads, they see candidates, where they're engaged and they're having to make intelligent decisions, right? They're not in some state that's not going to see a candidate where they're not really checked in. We're Republican voters are checked in. There is a clear openness 
among a big chunk of the Republican electorate. And we'll see how big it is, right? It could be as much as four or five percent of the overall electorate in the United States of Republicans who are now open to voting for Biden because of their disgust of Trump. Look, I do think something really broke in the Republican Party back in the spring of 2022, where it just the Republican Party became even too ugly and too awful and too dangerous even for Republican voters. And that's why they've continued to struggle to bring their coalition back together. And Trump is worse than he was in 2020. I mean, we've gone over some of that in the show tonight. And so if you're a wavering Republican, right, there is a lot more reason to waver than there was four years ago when he lost the election. And so, yeah, I think there is all sorts of early warning signs if you want to look for them. If you're interested in, in looking for the warning signs about Trump's and the GOP right now, they're all there blinking bright red and making loud noises that this is a troubled candidacy and a troubled party against a strong incumbent. And that is before the Democrats run a single campaign commercial about in right. vitro fertilization, which is the newest madness uh, to enter the, the campaign through the Republicans. Simon Rosenberg, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. We'll be right back. I can't wait to see what Seth Meyers and Joe Biden are up to on Late Night with Seth, Seth Meyers at 12.35 a.m. on NBC. That happened uh, like three floors up from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, set your DVRs if it's too late for you. You don't want to miss it. 